Hello, darlings. Yes, it's me, the titillating temptress in the flesh, and not much else, Elvira, mistress of the dark. You've entered the Gen Experience. I'm Victor, and as promised, part two of Elvira, mistress of marketing, and Halloween is ready to bust out all over. If you didn't see part one, no biggie, just watch them in reverse. And because I would hate you to leave right now, here's a quick recap. Even with five successful years in her own created horror hostess role, headlining theme park shows, TV spots and specials, and her own freaking starring role in a motion picture, Coors Light just can't come to grips with her own decision to assign Elvira spokesperson for their light beer. Relations began to break down with the holier-than-thou executives because every time they look at her provocative nature, they see Satan. While the brewery diluted her advertising involvement, she simply settled for a mug. A mug of root beer, that is. Pepsi welcomed her with open arms and wallets. I suppose Coors just had to purge their own impure thoughts when forced to gaze upon Elvira's perky and milky white bosom. And that, my friends, is where we left our bewitched maiden. Please make sure to click like right now so we can continue and consider supporting me by pressing subscribe. Thanks. Things continue to get convoluted here, and it's hard to make sense of the truth behind the scenes of the continuing Coors and Elvira saga. After Pepsi moved on with new marketing techniques, it seemed as if the Sam Hames succubus and the light beer Puritans were on talking terms once again. Suddenly, a new Coors campaign is making waves. The airwaves and Elvira stars in Halloween advertisements with a lighthearted spin. At least Coors' marketing team knew a good thing when they had it. Coors' campaign, Mally Boo Beach Party, was well received, and it was like she never left. Unfortunately, the religious zealots at the top were still there and couldn't separate business and belief. It wasn't long before they were at it again, sabotaging their own advertising goldmine. Nothing was going to stop Peterson from working, and she had the rest of the year for self-promotion. Who's better to promote yourself than you? If she didn't do it, no one would, and between all the beer drama, Elvira knew how to stay relevant and in the minds of the very finicky public eye. In perfect casting by the network, Elvira hosted a complete night of programming on their first Friday the 13th lineup, featuring Elvira in bumpers between the shows that evening in 1992. And one year later, The Beguiling Beauty would host a 12-hour long Halloween celebration, the Halloween movie Schlockathon on TBS. But it was 1994 when Cassandra made the biggest production to date. Even as the light beer soured, Elvira found joy with the birth of her daughter. Now that is some serious self-promotion, am I right? Elvira was printing money for cores, but the work began to change. A disembodied voice off screen, hiding her body behind objects, radio spots instead of TV advertising, and no more display likenesses, took its toll on Peterson and her paycheck. She had had enough. The company was hijacking their own advertising and her income. They weren't selling Happy Meals, they were selling beer, and she was doing that for them. Frustrated, they finally fractured their partnership for good in 1995. The world may have adopted the Queen of Halloween, but Elvira did not own that trademark on the title, and Coors would go on to crown a new one for a few years after, from a gaggle of gorgeous models and actresses. It turns out they didn't have any aversion to boobs. No, those still graced their marketing for years. It was vampires, witches, or devil spawn, or whatever they thought Elvira represented, that got them all hot under the collar. Like the character from her titular film, Chastity Pariah, Elvira was out on her caboose. It's Friday the 13th in 1995 and in October. Securing Elvira for a special promotion event from the 13-story Twilight Zone Tower of Terror was magic in the bottle as she hosted a celebration to honor the just over one-year-old attraction at the Disney MGM Studios. If you can't legally be Queen of Halloween, why not own Friday the 13th? But she wasn't done with promoting some good head. And as you may have guessed, it would be a dark beer. To rehabilitate a failing craft brewery in Minnesota, Elvira's Brewhouse Incorporated was born. The Brewhouse quickly launched Elvira's Night Brew and was advertised as a dark, full-bodied and <clears throat> robust lager. Get it? Robust. Unfortunately, the Night Brew didn't last long as the financial backers backed out. Elvira's Night Brew came to an end and so did Elvira's run as a beer saleswoman. Dude, this is awesome! She didn't have time to mourn that loss as she was juggling another set of balls. Pinballs, that is. Bally's scared stiff pinball machine debuted in arcades to the exhilaration of collectors and players everywhere. Bally was the name of her game and would even create other Elvira themed tables, like Party Monsters Pinball as well. The of the Dark has unleashed six 
tales of terror that will challenge your very... In 1997, our Woman of the Hour with the Hourglass figure starred in a motion simulator ride, House of Superstition, that made its rounds in the amusement park arena. While conquering everything else, why not primetime TV? The Elvira Show was a pilot to sell a TV series that may have worked better in 1989 but was passed on for its raunchy suggestiveness. Elvira squeezed as much sexual innuendo into a half hour as she stuffs into her own dress. Veteran TV actress Catherine Helmond was the aunt. There was a niece and even a talking cat, Renfield. Sound familiar? Well, it isn't a stretch to see the similarities with Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Not that Sabrina, but cool. And no, not this one. This one. This has the most similarities with The Elvira Show, except for the plunging neckline and double entendres. No. Mike? No. You don't know anybody named Mike? No. <laughs> Girl, you gotta get out of the house more. The pilot is a must-see for any fan, as you can't have too much of a good thing. Peterson proved to be as zany and wacky as she was quick of quip. Today, a regular sitcom series might be asking too much, especially comedy, and a sex comedy at that. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? Speaking of children, I could surely see an ongoing animated adventure series that fans would flock to, wouldn't you? After her first movie's theatrical failure, no studio would back her other big opening. So she did it on her own. Financing it herself, the film still failed to launch. Is it marketing? Is it her niche audience? Whatever it is, many viewers are torn which is better, Mistress of the Dark or the second Haunted Hills. What do you think? Do you have a favorite and why? Mistress of the Dark is the clear winner for me, but what about you? And do you remember when Elvira started that live show at Knott's Berry Farm in 1982? Well, see part one if you don't. Well, that show never stopped until now. Elvira would call it quits in 2001. The live show and the scheduled meet and greets plus autograph sessions took their toll. 9-11 was still fresh, and Peterson wanted to spend more time with her now seven-year-old daughter. This is one of those handful of times that Cassandra questioned her future and the future of her character. But she was still a working mother and knew where it was at, doing the thing that brought her original fame. The video cassette business was always something she could leverage with minimal work on her end. Packaging her horror hostess duties on Elvira's horror classics and box of horror, the VHS titles released in 2004 were always less time consuming, but kept the paycheck coming in. These video cassette offerings assured that anyone who thought of B-grade horror movies and horror hosts would always think of her. Countless competition shows infiltrated the airwaves at this time. They found the best singers or dancers, or those who could survive tropical elements in nothing but their underwear. By 2007, Cassandra was ready for something new, and she would ride this wave of reality competition show with the search for the next Elvira. But what exactly did that mean? Come to find out, nobody knew. Elvira was going nowhere, and after some confusing and awkward challenges on the show, the winner April Whalen unfortunately did but only one event. A Halloween parade in Oklahoma. That was that. April simply holds a title picked by the mistress in what looked to be an attempt to capitalize on that television genre becoming popular at the time. Some ideas are best laid to rest, and sometimes instead of jumping on the current bandwagon, it is better just let it pass by. But what's a ghoul to do next to keep the public wanting more? Release an album, of course. Gravest Hits is a pit of pendulum-swinging Halloween anthems, even including Here Comes the Bride, featuring Fred Schneider of the B-52s. The collection wasn't her first foray into music, mind you. In 1982, she released a single, TV. And in 1987, released two songs on her hit Halloween party album, Full Moon and Elvira Rap. That year, she also narrated a spooky Fright Sounds tape for Halloween Ambience. But it is 2010 that we receive an album of nine Elvira songs, along with four of her favorite haunted standards. She wouldn't be done with music either. In 2013, she would release her single, Two Big Pumpkins. With a name like that, Shouldn't it have been a double album? It was back to basics for Peterson. 2010 was an ideal time to reanimate her original show for new audiences and with new sets, new films, and a sharp 4K look. Movie Macabre was back for 26 episodes over three seasons. And if you two thought she wasn't aging, I'm sure it's the spell she put over all of us. That or a pound of makeup. Now, if you're gonna bring back Movie Macabre, then why not bring back The Haunts at Knott's? In the fall of 2013, Elvira burst back onto the scary farm stage with a new live show, Elvira's Cinema Seance. Her cup runneth over with Frightful Floor Show and a trip to Hollywood Hell. 
Knott's loves their jellies, whether from their berries or whatever jam Elvira was dishing out in her new live show each year during the Halloween season. Between shows at the farm, Elvira moved to Hulu in 2014 for 13 Nights of Elvira, a new show hosted by the mistress herself each night, counting down until the big day. But by 2017, Elvira performed her swan song for Knott's Scary Farm. That season was the last encore with the show incorporating a lot of tech and an homage to her original silver screen schlock, Mistress of the Dark. The show is more than you can handle and worked to get new generations to take notice. She now covered Boomers, X, Y, and Z. The final live show, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, is a grand finale to celebrate her 35th anniversary performing at Knott's, as well as a tribute to her first feature film debut of the same name. Her final bow is a testament to her dedication to the character, her genre, and those that love her. I've said it before, nothing says icon status more than a Funko Pop. Her first one debuted in 2016, and she has no less than eight, and that doesn't even include specialties. Like a spooky version of Cracker Jack, in 2018, we dug into Elvira's box, the Funko cereal of Mistress of the Dark. Looking for the prize, we went so far as to eat it, which made for some very interesting colors in the toilet. But we had to have that little mini Funko. What do you think? A better addition to the Monster Cereal lineup than this year's new introduction? Let me know in the comments. We all work to stay relevant in our job, our family, and even the world, but Elvira made it a career. During the COVID lockdowns, she went to her fans direct. Donning her iconic look, she produced content to keep fans talking and totally entertained, pulling some of her more obscure and often forgotten moments of her career, as well as producing new memorable content, like her song parody, Don't Cancel Halloween. And finally, and where I start to lose steam, is Elvira's contribution to the literary community. This is huge and wild and wacky and really hard to keep track of. The history of Elvira in fiction requires its own show. Oh, well, next year maybe. Between the 1987 and 1993 DC Comics, the current title she is involved with, co-written with collaborator David Avalone for Dynamite Comics, the original Elvira fiction novels, and more is enough to keep any avid reader busy. And then there's that time Cassandra wrote her own bit of parody, Bad Dog Andy. This has nothing to do with Elvira or Halloween. Just a mischievous Dalmatian who smokes cigars and works over a French poodle. But you can look that up. However, after the successful release of her Coffin Table picture book, one of my favorites, it is Yours Cruelly Elvira that is now making a splash. Finally, the definitive story of her life and straight from the hell's mouth herself. This will probably get into some real juicy drama and pre-Elvira shenanigans. Paul Rubens, yes, that Paul Rubens once said, it's very easy to write off Cassandra in the horrible way that people write off somebody who's beautiful and sexy. That all fell by the wayside as soon as I saw her perform. Elvira might have over 400 licensed products that give her one giant piece of her own pie, but it is her camp humor, sex appeal, and good-natured self-mockery that make her popular with late-night movie viewers, as well as have the longevity that has stood the test of time. Even today, as both men and women adore her, she is the poster child for success, for perseverance, and determination. She is the definition of your own brand, and selling it hard, and she isn't afraid of hard work, of course. She has done what she wanted and with what she had and proved to be a genius at all of it. Well, put a stake in me. I'm done. Thank you for joining me for part two of the show. If you didn't see part one, go back and check it out right now. If you don't... I got you, man. Oh, you're Thanks, Come see what we've got in store next week for Halloween and explore the rest of the channel for incredible content straight from the gen experience, like this one. Please remember to engage, click the like, press subscribe, and even comment and share. It's a cheap and easy way to support me. And like Elvira, I love cheap and easy. It's a great treat for me at Halloween too, so thanks again. And until next time.